welcome everybody to this uh, third talk within the Gauss lecture. Today, uh, Professor Block will be talking about, uh, uh, will be um, question whether uh, consciousness uh, overflows cognitive access. That was the question. are fundamentally different, um, or um, as I think, or whether consciousness is really just a type of cognition as so many philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists think. Um, however, I should say that the view that I am espousing is gaining in popularity as we speak. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be contrasting conscious seeing with knowledge of what was seen. And the big debate in this area um, my, now, there are various experiments that seem to many uh, philosophers and scientists to show that perception is sparse. So I believe that the right way to look at those experiments is that cognition is sparse. So this is right in the center of the topic of these lectures, which is the, uh, um, uh, the, the joint in nature between perception and cognition. Um, Okay, so according to me, perception is rich. Cognition samples from perception, but can only get some of perception. So the kind of intuition behind this, the one that I started with, is the sense you have in your daily life that there are so many um, percepts you have, and only a few of them are ones that you can attend to as in cognition, that it's uh, knowledge of what you are seeing. So here is the type, this is the original experiment that supports this idea. And this is, uh, this is uh, an experiment done by Joe Flashed for a very briefly, but it doesn't matter if it's 50 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds, you get the same, God, I'm really echoing. Uh, I don't know why that is. Um, then there's a, a, a blank period um, in which, well, sorry, let me, three rows of four letters, they'll say something like that. And you say, okay, tell me the letters you saw. And they, they can only get three or four, okay? So that's a, a well-known result and has been known for many years, is that people only seem to be able to get three or four letters. But they have a sense that they saw all of them, or almost all of them. So what Spurling's idea was, was to test the idea that they saw all or almost all by giving a cue, a tone, a high tone, an auditory cue. High tone for the top row, medium tone for the middle row, low tone for, for, the, for that row. Priority. The idea is that if you just sample from the image, your mental image, after the display has gone off, you can get uh, three or four from any given row, so your, the capacity of the image looks to be about three times the, the, as big as the capacity of what you can do if you're not cued to a row. Everybody get the idea? It's called partial report superiority. Maybe I should sit down where I won't get echo. Um, so partial report superiority, and um, uh, here's what Sperling says. He says, subjects enigmatically insist that they have seen much more than they can report afterwards. And, and Bernard Bars, who's opposed to my ideas on this, it concedes, and this is important, that experimenters serving as subjects, you can see this a million times, you can know, you, you can know all about it, and you still get the same experience of a kind of mental image. And then it has a very, um, it's very rich. It's a, and it's very rich not because the retinal display is rich, you can filter, I'll show you, how you can show that it's not retina, or in fact, it's known not to be early vision. It's known to mean intermediate level visions. Brain scanning has shown that these, these persisting representations are in mid-level vision. For those who know the, uh, some of the neuroscience, specifically area V4, um, which is a very good candidate for part of the neural basis of conscious experience. So, um, so that supports the rich. How many people see what's changing? No one? So no one has seen this before. Oh, good. So raise your hand if you see what's changing. 
Come on, somebody must see what's changing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to clue you in. It's these leaves. Okay, so you got, so you just experienced this phenomenon, which is that, so let me start up again. You can have a change which occupies a fair bit of your vision. Uh, a poor example, and a, 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 if somebody can make this work right, I, I'd be very pleased. It's, it's, it's originally is in the form of a GIF file, and to get it to work on a Mac is just, uh, I, I've tried all kinds of things, I just can't. Anyway, so I'm sure you'll see why I'm showing it. So something is changing, although you're getting a long white period. Um, Anybody see what's changing? <laughs> so it's this bar, how high the bar is. But, you know, it's, it's really a... Uh, so the reason I'm using this one, despite its problems, is that we, I have an eye-tracking trace for it. Uh, so this is a, a, um, uh, an eye-tracking trace. And what you see is uh, that if you look at where a typical subject uh, looks. They keep looking at the same thing, but it's an indication of attention. And what you find is something that people are not attending to. And this and many other results show this is an attentional phenomenon. The things that change that you cannot report, or you cannot report the changes, are things or properties that you are not attending to for one reason or another. And this is, you know, culture relative, it's relative to, for, depending on the display, to gender, age, every variable you might think of that might influence where somebody m might attend, okay? However, uh, I believe, and I think I will be able to show you, that very unlikely that that's the explanation. The explanation I favor is inattentional lack of access to the difference. The idea here is that you do see the features that change, but you don't conceptualize those features at a level that would allow you to notice the change. So the distinction between percepts and concepts, I believe, is absolutely crucial to understanding all these phenomena. And, uh, and as you'll see, the, the, the non-conceptual content, I believe the term was coined by Gareth Evans and has been played a big role in a lot of contemporary philosophy of mind. So just to be clear about the difference here, it's the difference between sparse phenomenology, that's inattentional blindness. People think, for example, you don't see the leaves that disappeared and appeared. So that's sparse, whereas the rich, so phenomenology is content of consciousness. The rich phenomenology, people of which I am one, we believe you did see the leaves and many other things that you can't report or don't report. Um, Sometimes this is called, rep, the sparse view is called representation failure. Sometimes the rich view is called comparison failure. So here are two models that give you the idea of, this is, you'll see how complicated a bit later, but to, at a first level of approximation, these, these are the models that you need to think about. So we know that it's an attentional phenomenon, it's an attentional bottleneck. But does the attentional bottleneck come before perception? It's really before conscious perception. So my opponents say, say yes, and they say you don't perceive many things that you think you perceive. Whereas I say you do perceive those things, but the attentional bottleneck comes in respect to, to, cogni to cognition, and that's why you don't report them, because um, only a small number can get into your cognition. Now, I'm going to get to the complicating factor, which is there, there are a number of phenomena that are kind of fun to have something to do with. Uh, many of you will have seen some of these before. Uh, and I think they show that the blindness option is wrong, but they don't show that my option, inattentional inaccessibility, is right. Uh, so this may seem a bit mysterious, but here we go. Okay, so... These are slow changes. So something is going to be changing slowly. See if you can spot what it is. Anybody seen what's changing? 
How many seen what's changing? <laughs> okay, I'll show you. The, look, I'm not going to go back and make it go back and forth, but here are the two pictures. So all the many things changed, including people where people were standing. Um, How many see what's changing? Okay, very few. Good. <laughs> okay, I can't resist letting it go to the end. But actually, now that it's near the end, I'm going to see if I can move it back. Can I see it now? How many see it now? Okay. It's that thing started off red, and it ended up purple. See? Like that? And it's an enormous change. So look. What's the chance that you didn't see this? Right, look at the big part of your visual field it occupies. You saw it, right? You saw it, but according to me, you didn't conceptualize uh, in a uh, two, two. Okay, here's one. That, if you haven't seen this, is great. If you haven't seen this, this is fun and, and very cool, but I, I, and I'm just going to let it run, and I hope the sound is working. So just watch. Ooh. Oh, no, don't, ah, stop, don't look. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. <laughs> it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, you know, it goes on. So I, I should say, by the way, that that is the only, there have been many uh, uh, videos like this produced by amateur uh, video makers. That is the only professional one, and it's, it's a BBC bicycle safety ad. Um, so, you know, it has real production values. So here's the point. You must have seen, look, so when it started, the guy had this coat. When it ended, he had that coat. Just one of, I don't know how many examples there are of, you must have seen them, right? You didn't conceptualize them. Okay, but, there, but it doesn't show inintentional inaccessibility. It shows blindness is wrong, but the trouble is there's a third explanation, which is uh, uh, what, what uh, Jeremy Wolf calls inattentional amnesia. That is, you saw it and you just forgot. You know, if my, and, and that's pretty plausible, and it fits with my, my story. I mean, my story is uh, you don't conceptualize the things that change, but look, if you don't conceptualize them, you just forget them immediately. You know, my story, you know, my intuition is that we just see so many things. We have so many experiences, most of them don't get into memory, right? Or if they get into memory, they get into memory in a very kind of very subtle way. So it doesn't decide between rich and sparse, okay? So ultimately, all those things, they, 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 I think they cast some doubt on the blindness interpretation, but they don't really decide the issue. Now, I think that, those, that it, amnesia is not so plausible for these things because, you know, those things just go back and forth. You can see 50 alternations and still not see, um, uh, still not notice what, change, what, what changed. So, look, here's the problem, which is going to come up again and again. And this is why, in case you're wondering, at the end, you may ask yourself, oh, now why is this philosophy? 
um, because I'll be doing a lot of uh, uh, mentioning of that they are the two options. In the end, all we have to go on is what the subjects report. And that ends up being the same. And so you can ask yourself, how in the world can we ever get evidence about which of those is right? Mind, <laughs> um, but how do you get at them? Okay, that's the problem. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to begin. So here, here's the, the, the uh, what, what the order of business is, and I don't know how much of this I'm going to get to, but I'm, what we've just been talking about is this spark. Um, let's see now. You know, I'm, I'm sort of feeling like this light could be. Can these lights be turned off? Because I'm, I'm making the, are they making the screen hard to see? No. no okay. Well, forget it then. If they're, not, if they're not making the screen hard to see. Um, okay. Um, so um, uh, so I will get to the end, and. What, I, what you'll see in the end is that the evidence is accumulating uh, in favor of the uh, inattentional inaccessibility view. And what's especially exciting for me, since I've been pushing this view for, for 20 years, scientists of Europe, um, uh, who has a chair in the Collège de France, which is the, you know, the pinnacle of French uh, uh, academia, um, he has argued that the issue cannot be decided. For, the, for reasons like this. It cannot be decided. There is no empirical content to the issue. Um, however, you will see, and I think this is a lesson that philosophers should have learned by now, that when you think, when you think you've shown that something cannot be decided, then what happens is some very ingenious person comes up with a way of deciding. So, um, now, I don't think any of the ways people come up with are bulletproof, but they do point in a certain direction. Um, Okay, so let's quantify. So the, um, the, the uh, a way to think about cognition is that in these experiments of the sort we're talking about, in your thinking, and so it becomes important to ask the question of how big that mental scratch pad is. Now, there are a variety of experiments that suggest that actually in most people it, that there is a capacity of three to four items. Now, a more complicated thing at the question. This is a, um, an experiment done um, in, in uh, there's a, I don't know if anybody knows about this, but there's this monkey island in, in, uh, off the coast of Puerto Rico uh, called Cayo de Santiago. I've actually been on this island and watched this experiment being done. And um, here is the, the island hunter who has a, a big bag of apple pieces, and the monkeys like apple a lot. And he counts and puts some number, like one, two in one bucket, and then one, two, three, say, in another bucket. And then he moves back, and he looks to see which um, a bucket. Four versus three compared with eight versus three. Reliable on four versus three chooses the four, but chance on eight versus three, you might think, why does the monkey think more or a lot or something like that? Okay, that's not the way the system works. The system does not have a more in it. It has something like, and I'll, I'll use this term, which I'm going to take back in a minute, but it has something like four slots in adult human beings. You get over that, and the system doesn't know what to do. Here's a, a similar experiment, um, uh, figots and carrots, and pieces of graham cracker. And it's even been done, I won't go into this in detail, with bees, and you get a, a similar result of three versus four. And um, uh, George Alvarez has uh, used many different materials and, and with this kind of thing. And what he's, uh, what, what he's discovered is that you get a different storage capacity depending on the complexity of the materials. Uh, but at least for certain kinds of items, it looks like the, the, the I won't go into the detail, but that the, the, the limit of capacity is somewhere around five. Now, that now can, here comes the qualifications. There's been a big debate in the literature between um, slot models and pool of resources models. And what has emerged is the slot models that I've been kind of talking in terms of really aren't right. What the, but the slots are kind of an emergent property of certain kinds of materials that, where you have stimuli that are sufficiently different from one another. And so it looks like you have a limited capacity for certain materials. And that, since those materials are the ones that are used in these experiments, 
you can, uh, you can speak of an emergent slot-like behavior. But I'm not going to go into it any further. Um, okay, so here is the way of combining um, spurling with change blindness um, from Victor Lamy's lab. It's a lot like the, um, uh, the spurling. Uh, so the idea is that you, 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 the idea is you, you have a circle of rectangles, you have a, a blank period, and then you have another circle of rectangles, and one of those rectangles can have changed orientation. And you can be given a cue either there or here after the first one has gone off or at the end. And here's what you find. They, uh, um, uh, what you find is, well, let's see if I can uh, ignore this at the mo for the moment. The, the, the basic distinction is between the cue being given here in the middle, as in the Sperling experiment, or at the, at, the, at the beginning. I can't actually see it, but it should be there. Can you see it? Okay. Um, uh, or at the end, here. And what you find is if you give it um, at the beginning, um, that your capacity is about all eight. You can get, you know, you're, you know, you're seeing the thing and then you get a pointer and so on. In this experiment that I, I'm talking about, you can see that the, uh, the cues come as late as about uh, 1,200 milliseconds. Okay, this cue is after the, this is the, this case, after the second display, when, you, when, when everything drops. Um, this experiment has been repeated by a number of different labs. Here's one, uh, a version uh, due to uh, my colleague at NYU, Dennis Pelly, but also, was based, the work was basically done by a graduate, but, sorry, this guy, Jeremy Freeman, who's now a, a, a well-known researcher, when this was done, he was an undergraduate. Um, and uh, so uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is because you can do these experiments are easy to do. Um, you know, an undergraduate can do them. So uh, somebody might think that it would be a good idea to do them. So they use, it's the same basic design, except um, uh, th what they're contrasting is the Q with no Q. And it turns out it works the same way. Um, and just look at the gray. Just, I'll, I'll just uh, forget about the green, because they're interested in, in another phenomenon. Uh, but just look at the, 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 this and the gray things here. When there's a Q, you get, uh, I can't really see how much that is done, then is extractable into conscious, uh, into working memory. Okay, so here is, I'm trying to be neutral uh, uh, for both of these kinds of experiments. Um, some kind of perception is richer than cognitive access, and here is the big problem. We don't know from the index of, you know, what you can report, really. Um, so he says, Bloch's notion of phenomenal consciousness remains intractably entangled with the need to obtain subjective reports about it. I like the reason I highlighted the about it because it suggests that he really does believe in it. Okay, sometimes he talks like he doesn't think there is any such thing. Um, and then he says, many experimental paradigms suggest that the intuitive notion of a rich but non-reportable phenomenal world is to a large extent illusory. Now notice, I'm not actually saying that that phenomenal world, that rich world is unreportable. I think you could report any given thing that you attend to. It's so I make a distinction, which I'll go into next time, between necessarily unreported and unreportable. It's like your lottery ticket. No lot there's no lottery ticket unless it's a fixed lottery. There's no lottery ticket that can't win, but inevitably, necessarily, almost all will lose, right? So anyway, so the re here's the thing. The reports... I believe, I, uh, with him, are the starting point. They're the data. I agree with that. But I think that you can apply the idea of abduction to get a conclusion. But they added an additional element to try to deal with the charge that people were doing this on the basis of unconscious um, uh, images. Uh, so they asked... If the subject saw a change, then they said, okay, what was the pre-change item? That is, what did it change from? And then the subject had to choose among four things, and he had to identify the pre-change item. And the result was, oh, I'm sorry, the result was uh, to not only notice a change, but then to be able to identify the pre-change item. Now this, 
it's far from conclusive, but I think it does put some pressure um, on the unconscious perception hypothesis. I mean, and there's other phenomena. So here's one way to approach this, is to look in detail at the nature of unconscious perception. Another group, um, uh, uh, which uh, includes both philosophers and, and psychologists, is that what's in consciousness is some kind of a generic representation. It's a representation that there is a circle of rectangles without specifying the orientation, or that there are uh, uh, three rows of four letters, but without what the letters are, or, or enough information in consciousness about the shapes to know what they are. So these are my two major opponents. Both philosophers and psychologists have taken the... the so the real question is, what about the uncued rows, right? If, if you put it in the cued row, the subject knows what it is. In the uncued rows, you sometimes got mistakes. So it's, that's a crucial distinction. Sometimes they don't notice them in the uncued rows. Okay, now, I think it follows harder to see, okay? The right kind of mask, you can make the thing invisible. Okay, so why do they use a mask? They use a mask because without the mask, they didn't get the result. Okay, then they get a Q. Then you're supposed to re report the cued letters, okay? Then, on some trials, they had these things, and you're supposed to move your cursor over these things um, to, uh, 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 to uh, indicate whether any of those were in the display. And some of them are what are called wingdings. I don't know if you're familiar with this term. You know, those odd-looking smiley face or the star. You know, I, don't know, I guess on, on, in Microsoft Word, they're called wingdings, maybe, um, in English. Um, so note that the wingdings come after the cue. Anyway, the result is that um, uh, uh, subjects could get all the wingdings, whether they were making a, a real good effort at this. So here's my drawing of fragments. I'm just using musical notes, because that's the only thing on my keypad that, look, that is remotely like a fragment. So. What's in memory, according to them, this is their view, what's in economic memory before the queue is a bunch of fragments. You think that, um, uh, that because any row you attend to, you could immediately report. They call it a fragment illusion because the idea is that you think that you will always were conscious of those things that were queued. It's a version of what is sometimes called the refrigerator light illusion. The idea is that somebody might think that the light in the refrigerator is always on because it's always on when you look. Okay? <laughs> uh, so it's like that. So it's, they think that, you know, when people say they say it's not about what happens after the cue, but the fragment illusion concerns after the cue. So that is, I think, a, a, a problem. But it's not the main problem. The main problem is this. We wanted to use reduced contrast to maintain task pressure. So he's admitting that he made the things harder to see by making them low contrast. And then he says, importantly, we also added a backward mask to the stimulus array to eliminate possible retinal persistence of the visual information, which is not supposed to constitute phenomenal consciousness, but rather to input the phenomenal level. And he can see rolling subjects get three or four in a given row. Um, Queen Air's subjects got one and a half um, in any given row. So he had to make the thing so hard to see so as to really reduce the icon. The partial report superiority is really at a minimum here. So odd, you know, in, your, uh, in your retina you have two kinds of receptors, rods and cones. It's the rods that are, um, uh, that are involved in retinal persistence. Uh, however, um, the, the rods are colorblind. So you can eliminate retinal persistence by using this instead of this. Okay? Okay. So I'll go, um, you know, I think maybe I'm going to skip this because I only have 10 minutes. So, but do we want longer? You know, it cuts into discussion. What? Well, I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly. Okay, so what's, I, I want to explain the generic, so there is this distinction between generic and specific content. So again, I've tried to draw the generic view. This, a lot of philosophers have held this view. That is, that um, 
what's in iconomembry before the queue is generic representations that tell you that there's a letter there, but maybe a letter at a certain place. Uh, but they don't tell you uh, what, anything about the shape of the letter. And in the case of the, um, the, the, the rectangle one, what you have, no, I couldn't, I couldn't, I don't know, it's very hard to know how to draw an oriented non-square rectangle without specifying the orientation, okay? So that's what's supposed to be here. Oriented rectangle, um, not, not an oriented non-square rectangle with no specified orientation, a location and, a, and maybe like the word rectangle or something. Um, so here are the two opposed views. This is their view. My view is it does not make a commitment about what's in unconscious perception, but I think probably the whole thing is in unconscious perception. I believe that conscious perception is the tip of an iceberg. Okay, so just to remind you what the sort of motivating idea is, so the hypothesis that I'm going on is that it's consciously conceptualizing the stimulus. Oh, I haven't said with global broadcasting, that's what something gets into work, remember, the mental scratch bag. Hypothesis two is that non-conceptual conscious perceived empirical thing that can be looked at that might get you a clue. So ensemble properties are sort of like, they are the properties like I see a grid of letters or something like that. There's many things that people have, can, can report on that don't seem to interfere with their ability to report the specific details. And a group, an Israeli group, um, including one philosopher, Hilla Jacobson, uh, did an experiment that came out um, uh, last year um, in psych science, which is probably the, maybe the best uh, um, psychology uh, psych you know, journal for a big difference with Sperling. Of course, the arrays were much bigger. So first they had the cue, then comes the array, then a blank, and then a box appeared which was over, which could be over one letter in an uncued row. And then the idea is the person has to report that letter. So they try to minimize the demands of response. What's that letter is the, is the idea. Everybody understand the procedure? Um, and then they made a color diversity judgment. Low or high color diversity and the, the jack on how well they were doing. So they really were pushed to get the letters right. That is, get this letter right. The letter, especially importantly, in the uncued row. That was what was crucial. Um, uh, so, and on the color diversity, they had no right answer, just your subjective impression. They were kind of low pressure on the diversity, okay? Because they, you know, they wanted to maintain the diversity as an unattended, and the unattended rows, they were interested in the diversity judgments about the unattended rows, so they didn't want to pressure the subjects to attend to the unattended rows, right? They didn't want to drain attention away from the cued row into the unattended rows. Okay, so here is the first result. The first result is that, um, well, I guess maybe the first result should be the blues are bigger than the reds. The blues are the um, cases where the cued and uncued rows have the same. Here's the thing, this, it's about the same. Okay, so they got about three letters independently of whether the diversity task was about cued and uncued. And the reason this is important is it shows that what was going on was not a matter of draining attention away from the main task. It was done via unconscious perception. Now here, this is the real crux of the issue. And this is where they, they did an extremely interesting set. What they did was they used three ways of seeing whether the information about color diversity in the uncued rows was coming from unconscious perception. Now, you may, uh, maybe I've built it up too much because maybe you'll think it's uh, underwhelming, but, you know, the thing is it's so hard to do any experiments on consciousness. The fact that there are three different methods get this point in the same direction is, I think, very significant. So the first method is this. Okay, so we're going to see three. This is number one of three. Okay, so the big issue is did they, were the awareness of colors in the uncued rows, or I should say that in order to judge diversity in the uncued rows, you have to have seen at least two. You don't get a diversity from seeing one. Okay, so you have to have seen at least two colors. They're only getting three letters right, and in addition, they're getting 
um, at least two things from the uncued rows. Okay, so how do we know? First of all, they had three methods. First of all, they had um, uh, uh, uncued row, rows, no colors, and 93% of the time when the uncued rows were, were no colors, they got that right. That's item one. That, again, suggests they really were seeing the colors consciously. They were aware enough of them to use that report. The second thing they did is a whole, even when they gave very low vis visibility ratings, but its diversity required enough awareness to be able to say high visibility. Okay, so that's the second item, and the contrast between average and, and, uh, and diversity is really quite an interesting and suggestive. Now, this one is a little, a little bit weaker, but they did a, um, a, a, a simulation of uh, average versus diversity. So the red is average, and the, the uh, blue is, is diversity, and their simulation involved a noise parameter that was meant to um, uh, duplicate um, the um, uh, effects of, of the masks, you know, to the extent that they could do that on a computer. And what they found was that the, the average judgments didn't really, weren't really affected much by the noise, but the diversity judgment. Okay, the conclusion is there's probably conscious awareness of specific items in unattended rows and spurring like tasks. Okay, suggesting rich conscious perception. And the methodological improvement here is interesting. It's to use these ensemble judgments that seem to get into your mental scratch pad without reducing the number of specific items you're aware of. Um, so it seems like a way of getting around the problem that you have the same cognition. Why? Because, well, really, you don't have the same cognition. There are indica and I'll show you some other cases next time of how you can get around the apparent impossibility of using subjects' judgments to get uh, um, un some understanding of their um, uh, conscious perception versus their unconscious perception. And that's the end. Hi. Um, so it, it's about the sparse versus rich conception of uh, perception. Um, so it, it seemed to me that, and maybe I'm wrong about this, that there is no big disagreement about most of the underlying facts. There is no disagreement about the information that hits the eye, whether yeah. that has an impact in the brain, this and that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if, if by seeing we understand something like, well, you can only see that uh, the stuff you are consciously aware of, then we have to agree with the uh, sparse conception of perception. If we don't require that, then we have to agree with the rich conception of perception. That, you know, if I explain it like that, it seems like... Word C, then it wouldn't be interesting. No, but it's not about that. It's about what's conscious. It's about whether there's more in your conscious mind that can get into your cognitive mind. You don't even have to use the word see or perceive. Um, you can state the issue without even using the, ter the, the terms that might be disputed. And incidentally, uh, on my view, um, uh, uh, perception can be either conscious or unconscious. And I don't base that on terminology, I base that on Consciousness, conscious perception and unconscious perception are the next time and the time after of reliably producing unconscious perception that will work moderately well even here, even in a room that, uh, you know, not in a lab. So we can produce um, unconscious perception reliably. It uh, obeys many, it has many of the properties of conscious perception, including obeying the perceptual constancies. Um, it's a personal level perception that is relevant to your um, uh, uh, beliefs and desires. So, um, you know, I, I will mention an experiment that <laughs> suggests that unconscious perception tracks your gender preferences in a romantic partner. Um, <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, anyway, so, but I'll show you that, I'll show you that experiment. So this suggests that unconscious perception is person level and is the same kind of thing minus, as conscious perception and only minus the consciousness. Right. But 
helps. But thanks. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Rafael. Maybe I'm the black sheep here. So I'm, I'm a mathematician. And um, 12 years ago, I started working with this neuropsychology laboratory. They wanted someone to do statistics, which I don't do. But they gave me this book to read about implicit learning and implicit memory. So it, it really got my attention that some concepts were, some amnesic people were able to conceive unconsciously, obviously, being, being amnesic. So there was this artificial grammar learning that I, it reminded me of something of algebra. So 12 years ago, I decided to, I designed an experiment to show if there was some of this implicit learning of algebraic concepts. Uh, amazingly, there is some learning on that. The trouble is I haven't found the audience where to show my results. But it would be interesting to know what about this implicit thing about learning and memory, yeah. whether it's conscious or not. Or yeah. Unconscious. So, of course, I don't know your, those experiments that you described, but I, I know similar experiments. In fact, there's some quite famous experiments done on guy H.M., yeah. who's a famous, um, um, you know, hippocampal, they, they did an operation and took out his hippocampus, and he can't, could, you know, he's dead now, but, he, and, but we have his brain online. Um, <laughs> really, they have a slice-by-slice slice representation of his, the guy's brain. Anyway, one of the most interesting discussions, d discoveries in the field of memory is this uh, distinction between um, declarative memory um, and um, um, uh, procedural memory. And uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the, the case that I know about uh, it with him which might, might be a little bit similar to the case you're talking about, is his learning of how to do the Tower of Hanoi problem, uh, which, he used, which he learned in some pretty much like with the, 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 the learning curve of a normal person, even though every time you showed it to him, he, 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 he didn't know what it was and claimed he'd never seen it before. I see how it, in, how it changed via a box like it was a symmetry. So some many people were telling me, I don't know wh why I get the answers right, but I get them right. They were surprised because they were able to know. I mean, they were able to answer correctly, but they didn't know what the box could do. At the end, I would uh, ask them explicitly. I would draw a figure and, and draw a box and ask them to see, to tell me how it would fall after crossing the box. And they weren't able to say how. But still, they answered correctly most of the most of the questions. So yeah. I'm, I'm interested in, in seeing if there's a mathematical way or to learn mathematics unconsciously or not. Yeah, I, 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 I bet you can. It might be worth some money too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, look, one thing I, I like about that result is it suggests something that I believe, which is that the unconscious mind is pretty powerful. All kinds of stuff goes on in the unconscious mind now, unconscious perception has been much studied, but unconscious cognition is much harder to study. And un yeah. I don't think so. How about now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if there's any money behind what I'm going to ask, but uh, do you think there is, was, hmm. was I clear? Yes, yes, the question is clear, it's just the trouble is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, uh, nothing is coming to mind. I mean, I think enriching our understanding of cognition and consciousness is, you know, it's, it's like any uh, uh, um, abstract issue. If, to the extent that you understand better, it might have some application. I should say that that change blindness stuff has, you know, the reason there's a bicycle safety ad using those change blindness ideas get done by the BBC is that people have begun to realize that um, change blindness is very important to safety issues. Um, you know, uh, one very dramatic experiment um, by Brian Scholl 
which I may have mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it again because it's significant, is um, cognition is involved in pretending to ha have a conversation and perceiving. So, you know, it's a really good reason why people should be forbidden from using a cell phone while driving um, or while piloting an airplane or uh, experiment uh, like getting them to describe uh, and whether you can see if the descriptions have more elements before and after maybe some kind of exercise or something. Okay, so let me um, actually go back to the work memory uh, display. Uh, okay, so um, I said that, that um, uh, working memory for many types of stimuli has a capacity of three or four. But I, I, I remember three or four unrelated letter-like things. Uh, but if they're, if they're grouped in the right way, you can remember more. So, well, this would be more useful for an American audience but, uh, than if a U.S. audience. But anyway, here's, I'm going to tell you nine letters. FBI, CIA, IRS. Such a person in such and such a year and the, you know, the score of the World Series and, you know, whatever, you know. You know he, he, he could chunk them using, and he got it up to, he got it, but he, it didn't change his, his working memory span for other things. Um, so it's a, you know. Thank you. Thank you in this idea that conscious working is different for different perceptual systems. Um, there are uh, change blindness experiments that have been done for audition um, and tactile stimuli. If there, if some, if, if there is a, a, a perceptual modality that's different, it's probably smell and maybe taste. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, some people think that smell isn't perception. So, you know, one issue is whether there's a, what, you know, the, the issue would be whether it's sensation instead of perception. So, for vision, you can distinguish between sensation and perception in the sense that there is a sensory level that has not yet got to the level of objective representation. You know, where you, where constancies operate and all these things that help you to guess with your, your vision what, what's happening in the world. So, and I just don't know about whether, you know, I know mostly vision. You know, look, I'm a philosopher. If you're a philosopher, you know, you, you can read the empirical literature. But to read the empirical literature on just vision and attention and working memory, oh my God, it's a full-time job. So I would like to ask you why they could not reproduce this kind of replay in this case and say, look, diversity is just like his or something like that. Yeah, so that actually is their view. Oh. So um, the, the term gist is another term. So, um, here's the thing, there are, so the terms, those terms like gist and ensemble turn out to be too crude. They don't, for example, distinguish between average color and color diversity. So one of the things they had in mind in, in, in their, in, when they did this, this extra experiment with the making the stimuli invisible or somewhat invisible. So their, the idea they had in mind there was to try to distinguish between different kinds of gist or, di so the idea, their idea was, the intuitive idea was, how do you know what the diversity is? You've got to see two specific colors, at least. Average can be just some kind of, you get an impression. Um, you don't, you know, you can, um, maybe there's, you don't have to actually register the specific colors as the idea. And that was backed up by the fact, uh, the kind of worry that you're, you're, you're suggesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure somebody will do some other version. And, you know, look, of course, it's controversial. There's going to be, I'm sure there's going to be some, pe I'm sure there are people now on the opposite side doing experiments that are going to try to get some other interpretation of this. Um, you know, it's a rather crucial issue how many things are in conscious perception 
And you know, this is a dramatic uh, foray into the, um, <laughs> into the overflow uh, um, direction. Uh, so I'm sure none of this is conclusive, but it is a pretty dramatic. Yeah, so they have in mind the, the, the issue that you're worried about. Yeah, so I was going to ask something similar. Why, why you thought that um, they couldn't say something similar to what they say about color diversity uh, from what they say regarding uh, average color? But, I mean, you just... You just um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, in addition, I just remind you that uh, they had this visibility thing. Yeah. You could do the average unconsciously, but not the, but not the diversity. But also the simulation contrasted average with, uh, uh, with diversity. So they're trying, you know, I mean, one of the big active areas now in perception research is this gist ensemble stuff, and people are making distinctions between a number of different gist-like properties. It's really a cool, uh, cool thing. So maybe you're thinking they're just, it just moves and pushes them in the wrong direction because they keep having to add more things to the ensemble or the uh, gist things. They're having to add. Well, the opposition will have to show that there's something wrong with this, th those two, um, well, actually all three of these, these interventions that seem to show that, that consciousness is required for at least the diversity kind of, uh, right. of gist or ensemble. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a different question? Just perception. But V1 is always activated in perception, and so that suggests right there that there is some unconscious part of, conscious per of normal perception that you've always got an unconscious representation. Furthermore, very likely V2 is only, you know, uh, only causally... Con so there, but if the evidence is less strong, and of course there's all kinds of subcortical aspects of perception. So I think there's a lot that's going on unconsciously in every percept. Um, so I, my, if you, my view is that every percept uh, every conscious percept is also an unconscious percept. So but the unconsciousness overflows the consciousness, includes the conscious perception and overflows it, the unconscious one. What? Say that again? Yeah, yeah. So you're thinking whatever is in the conscious uh, uh, percept is also in the unconscious level, plus more... No, no, I'm not saying whatever is in it. Maybe in some raw form, uh -huh. but of course those higher levels are doing something. Right, right, right. Uh, you mentioned that there were uh, two responses to the phenomenon. And you mentioned a third view, the inattentional amnesia, right? And you said that your view is consistent with that. But I guess, uh, basically because it's consistent because you say that we forget, uh, we forget what we, where the changes if we don't conceptualize them. But I guess that uh, your view is, is a bit, you know, the attention is a richer perceptual phenomenon rather than a conceptual phenomenon. In fact, we can say that, say, maybe animals or individuals that cannot uh, or that do not have a conceptual capacity can pay attention to the changes after having seen them, right? So, yeah. Okay, so actually, I, I believe what you believe, not what you say I believe. <laughs> so I think that conceptualization is required uh, to get a representation into the uh, cognitive system. But I believe at the perceptual need cognition for conscious perception. Um, so, um, yeah. Attention. attention. Okay, so the, the role of attention, uh, I believe, so look, I, I believe that without attention, we don't have a definitive answer of whether attention voluntary um, and it happens very quickly at about 100 milliseconds. Whereas conscious, uh, but, you know, um, um, endogenous attention, when you decide to pay attention, takes longer, maybe two, three hundred, four hundred milliseconds. So these are different, somewhat different phenomena, although I think they have very similar effects. Probably conceptualization may require some attention at some point.
I, I want to touch on, I'm sorry, I want to touch on, on something you just said um, very much in passing that is not very central to today. So I, I didn't mean it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe what I'm going to ask you is just like completely off topic or something like that, but it's uh, what I'm interested in, so I'm sorry. Uh, it's about uh, the iconic format of, of perception. You, and very, very much in passing, you said that it's kind of at least problematic to think that if how you can iconically represent the, um, a quadrangle that is there, but you don't know whether it's like this or like this, right? And then I think you, you did say that, right? So I was, I was, okay, first tell me if you didn't say that. But okay, it, it, you seem to say that. So my, my question is like three tier. First, just why you think that? And the second is, in, your, in these examples you have letters, right? And so you, you, have, you have to be committed to the idea that you can represent iconically letters as letters, right? And that, that, that is not going to be, that is not going to be a problem. And, but yes, it can be something like faces okay. or letters. Yeah, good. Okay, I don't quite think any of the things you attributed to me, but let me say, but, okay, so on the issue of, um, okay, so on, what I said was that it is hard to believe, and I'm very skeptical, that you could have a generic representation of an oriented rectangle that did not specify the orientation. Oriented non-square rectangle. No, an iconic. I'm talking about iconic representation. Imagine this. You're in a house. You go out the front door. There's a gate. You open the gate. You turn. You go to the corner and mail a letter. Everybody imagine that? Which way did you turn? Is there anybody who, didn't, who don't, does not have a representation of which way they turned? Is your answer, oh, I didn't specify that? Anybody? Oh, really? No shit. Okay, oh, interesting. Imagination, <laughs> you don't, people always have specified. Now, the trick in doing a, an experiment, and this is where we really got hung up, is that if you give people a test, and then you have to have some way of distinguishing between a detail that's added in response to the question and a detail that was there already. Um, and I don't mean it, I'm not trying to say that there can never be generic um, um, imagistic contents. In fact, I'm on record as arguing that there can be. In fact, this very issue has just come up recently a couple of times. I can send you, I've just written a reply. So, uh, I'll send you both, uh, both, of those, both of those things. But then what about letters? Because from what you said, it seems that the, like the mental image we keep, uh, the one that occupies the chunks, is we don't represent it as an image but as a letter. So okay, I don't agree with that. So okay. letters as opposed to shapes. Not in this, but but when you mention the how we can chunk our yeah. our memory, like using CIA, FBI, yeah. things like that, then those are are letters. Okay, chunking as far as we know, is a cognitive thing. And so once ah, okay, you chunk okay, them, okay. you have to Perfect. have letters. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. In, in the case of the images where we can tell the differences, like with the purple floor or the red floor, the changes, uh, if I understand your view correctly, you're saying Could you that... hold the microphone a little further away? If, if I understand your view... It's too loud. Yeah, okay, yeah. If I understand your view correctly, in the case of the images where we can tell the changes, you say that it's because we can see them, but we can't conceptualize them, we don't conceptualize them, and that's why we can't tell why, which are the differences. I would like to ask what does conceptualize mean, and whether that means that we form a representation, or what's the role of representation in this case? Yeah, um, 
Okay, I, I'm not going to be able to say, I, I have wondered about this question quite a bit. And as I said last time, the one thing I think we know about conceptualization is that when you conceptualize a representation, it gets into your cognitive system and is freely usable in reasoning um, in, in your cognitive system. And when it's just a percept, it isn't. Um, but whether it has to be, my guess is that there has to be some kind of a change in format. Um, you know, this issue, in effect, was raised by, by Buckley. You know, we don't know. Do you just ignore the fact that in your image, the two sides and angles are equal? Um, or is there some change of format? You know, I'd, be, I'd love to know the answer to that question, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'd love that too. Thank you. I have, I have also one question. So I want to ask you about something that you mentioned in reply to Dahan. So you said that, or I, uh, anything is reportable if attended. But then if, if we distinguish uh, percepts on the one hand and concepts on the, on the other, it might well be the case, so I'm, I'm doing again just armchair philosophy, but this is a possibility, and I wanted to know whether you want to rule it out, that we deploy the very same concept for two percepts. In this case, there is a difference we cannot tell. I mean, this is not something that we can report. Even if we attend, our cognitive capacity is, is restricted. So, and I'm, I'm thinking of this maybe as an explanation of cases like, like uh, color sororities. But in any case, whether I wanted to ask you what you think about that and whether you think that is not a possibility or... Sure. Uh, below what's called, you know, the just noticeable difference, so called. So the simplest one is you have three. You've, you know, one, two, three. You can't see the difference between one and two. You can't see the difference between two and three, but you can see the difference between one and three. Okay, now the question arises, do one and two, does your experience of one and two, does it differ phenomenally? Um, or uh, does it not? If it doesn't differ phenomenally, you've got this problem that one and two are the same phenomenally, two and three are the same phenomenally, and then one and three aren't the same phenomenally. So one approach has been uh, uh, the one that Sebas is, is uh, uh, suggesting, is that the way to think about it is your, your, your phenomenology does differ between one and two and between two and three, but what's the same is your concepts. The concepts you're applying are the same. Um, yeah, that seems to me to be real, a real possibility. You know, I think... I wrote it. I'm, what? I wrote it. Oh, okay. It did sound kind of familiar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I just wanted to know your... Yeah, it sounds to me like a real possibility. Any questions? Okay, I have another question. If, if, if I can. Would you mind going to the uh, last slide where you were showing different places where attention can be located? Yes. Uh, yes. That? Yeah. Uh, one of the main topics as far as I know, uh, from at the beginnings of the empirical research on attention was on whether attention was a uh, uh, pre-perceptual process or a semantic process. So where is uh, attention uh, to be located? And you know what if people say that all, all over the place. But here on, on, those, on those views, the, the attentional bottleneck is located uh, in certain positions according to, to different views. I, I would love both models. Well, there could be attentional processes previous to having uh, visual information, whether there is any, any evidence in any case, and whether in this case we should conceptualize uh, attention as two different processes, attention one and attention two, yeah. or the one and the same. What's your views? Yeah. On, or um, okay, good, good, good question. Um, hmm. Um, okay, so as Sebas said, there's been this debate in the literature from the very early days of, of attention on what are called early versus late attentional bottleneck views. And there are experiments that seem to support both sides, and as Sebas said, but maybe cryptically, um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the result 
that I think every vision scientist would agree with is that attention operates at a number of different levels and that the experiments that support it early, the experiments that support it late, they involve sort of different things going on and it works and, it's, and, and you can have early attention and late attention. Okay, so, so now he's, so what he's asking me is, uh, you know, you can see in this diagram that, um, uh, so the, the real contrast, is, the, the important contrast is between this one, what he's asking is, um, do I think it maybe could operate in both places or, or what? Um, okay, so I believe what everybody believes, which is that it can operate at a number of different points. So really the question is what's going on in the experiments that are under dispute. So I think probably a certain amount of attention is needed just to do the experiment. You know, the, I don't, I don't, uh, um, um, so maybe even the unconscious ones are, are to some extent perceived. But where's the bottleneck? So I think the bottleneck that's getting the big results is the bottleneck between conscious perception and cognition. So whether, and whether it's the same kind of attention, you know, that's an interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Um, in all these experiments, it's um, endogenous or top-down. How about asking me a question I can answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's just a, something I'm, I'm curious about. So when I was reading, so since I start studying this thing, the, the origin of the debate was on the distinction between cognitive access and, and consciousness, and then attention came into play, and sometimes there are notions of attention where it's just attention is defined as the mechanism that allows you to get the information into the working, me into the working memory, into the global workspace, and this is the way in which, for instance, uh, Jesse Prince thinks, thinks of it, but then some of the experiments, uh, uh, you m can keep this notion of attention, and then the, then the experiment seems to show that there is no what we intuitively understand as attention. And I, I, it seems to me to be, to be attention about uh, words, but how is it related to our intuitive notion of yeah. attention? Um, yeah, so um, look, I don't really agree with the Jesse Prince type of uh, methodology of simply postulating or defining attention as what makes the transition between from Marissa Carrasco on, on attention. You know, she never defined it that way. It's not defined that way in the empirical literature. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that is, you know, moderately well understood, at least some aspects of it. Um, um, are, 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 you know, but I think one should use the, the um, uh, you know, one should think of attention um, at least attention as it plays any role in, in perceptual phenomena in a way that's grounded in the scientific notion. So I, I'm, I'm not fond of this idea that we can just define the word attention to mean what Prince means, even though I, I think that it plays a, a very important role, what, he did, what he's talking about. Is there any other question? that can train and can, I don't know if I can say that, improve their perception. Now, there's a very interesting case in music of people that have absolute pitch. I don't know if that's the name in English. Yeah. People that can identify intervals and that can, can identify tones that normal people cannot. Now, the thing is that some people say that that ability is innate, natural. My question is this. Uh, in order to express that ability, I need to learn concepts. I need to learn the concept of do, re, mi, fa, sol, or the concept of a fifth or anything like that. The thing is that if it's an innate ability, what's going on here is that that person is able to have a very rich perception of sounds. That's maybe one option. But another option is, no, uh, the perception is more or less the same perception as normal people, but the ability of categorizing those sounds is the thing that is different among other people. I don't know 
if yeah. I, I'm clear on this. No, that's very clear. Um, okay, so there is a literature on this issue, and I have kind of skimmed some of the papers, but I don't remember them that well, but I'm pretty sure that the very issue you're asking about has actually been studied, and I, I have actually referred to some you can do that. You can do match to sample with pigeons. You know, you train the pigeon so that when something appears over here, and then there's a number of possibilities over here, if the pigeon pecks on the right one, it gets a reward. If it, if it uh, pecks on the wrong one, it gets a punishment of, that, you know, there's a delay before it can get a reward again. Or, you know, you can do it different ways. But um, you can do the same thing with people where they match to sample, but you're not saying anything about what, what the property they're matching is. Uh -huh. um, and then, you know, it just it appears in the experiment that if they get the, the, the you know, the, that they, they need fine-grained perception in order to get the reward. Um, okay, so you can try to minimize the concepts involved. And then there's the, ish, this, the somewhat separate issue of memory. You know, that is, uh, you know, such and such. And... Um, uh, so uh, my, my understanding is, uh, my, my, remem my memory of it, to the extent that I remember, is that those are separable and that there is a huge innate component to both. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember very well anymore. No, that's right. But, yeah, I can give you some literature, some wonderful things written on yeah. it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, man. <laughs> and just... Just a reminder that the next session will be on Tuesday, okay? Because Monday is in, in, in the Instituto. Hmm? Well, they were discussing with the next. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the sessions will be on Tuesday. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Let me, let me just turn this off. I